So welcome to the Restless Politics Question Time with me, Rory Stewart. And me, Alistair Campbell. And a reminder, we've got a live date in the diary to tell you about on stage performing the rest is politics live london palladium wednesday march 22 they go on general cell on friday and we will tweet the link in the morning and now let's get on with some questions yeah so well first question i want to start with is obviously i talk a lot about max miller the cheeky chappy because he played at the winter gardens and played at palladium and and the question is question question from joe is uh, what what what's the best max miller joke so i'm going to give you a max miller joke so for those of you who don't know Max Miller, great twenties musical comedian, and uh, so he, he goes up on stage. He says, um, "He says I, I I I was in Egypt recently, and and I, I was I was hoping hoping to get married. And I, I said to the pharaoh, Mister Pharaoh, will you will you give me give me your daughter in marriage?' And he said, "Yes, yeah, certainly, certainly I will, Max. Certainly I will. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll give you two acres and a cow. I haven't seen the two acres yet. There we are. That's the joke. Anyway, the only thing that's oh my <laughs> god." Oh my God! The only, the, only, the only thing that's interesting about that joke is that it's a Lloyd George joke, because Lloyd George believes that the fundamental way to set someone up economically was two acres and a cow, and a lot of what we do in Africa at the moment is actually about helping people get a cow. It makes a huge difference. In fact, Robert Maxwell, your old boss, said that when he was growing up in Ruthenia in the Carpathian Mountains, the greatest ambition that he'd had as a young man was to get a cow. That's how you made yourself in a village. Yeah, right, enough very of that. true. Over to you for a bit. Right, well, question. I think that was, I'm absolutely convinced that Max Miller will have got a lot of laughs out of that joke, Rory, but I, I, I love Thank the you. way you tried to turn it into a serious point at the end. <laughs> I'm going to take you to something more serious. Emma Stacey, I'd like to know your thoughts on nurses being balloted to strike. Whether you think we can get the support of the public and will they understand it's not just about pay, but standards of care given due to shortages in recruitment. Vincent Pettivell, as a nurse, I have voted for industrial action this week. I'd love to know both of your thoughts on this. If we as a union vote for strike action, thank you for, as always. Well, I mean, okay, let, let me start from my sort of funny ex-Tory background and say firstly that we should have huge sympathy for the fact that nurses are incredibly overworked, often very underpaid. And of course, it's got much, much worse since Brexit because all the immigration regulations about bringing in nurses from other countries haven't kept up with the demand. So we're hundreds of thousands of people short, and are going to come hundreds of thousands more people short over the coming years. So there is a huge problem. But of course, and this isn't really a good answer to nurses, but it's worth thinking in terms of our program, our podcast, that this is just the thin end of the wedge. The entire public sector is strained and stretched and is facing 10% rises in inflation. And that's actually often underestimating it. If you, if you think about going to the supermarkets at the moment, you'll find that many basic goods have jumped much more than 10% in the last few months. You know, people are, you know, if you're buying cheese at the moment, you'll find it's often up 30, 40%. That's true for a lot of other staple products. You're taking a long time not to answer the question here, Roy. Well, I suppose what I'm saying is I think I've got a lot of sympathy, but we should also be aware that there's going to be a lot more strike action by many, many more people. And we're going to find ourselves, I fear, going back to something that's going to feel more like the 1970s. There's going to be a lot of striking going on. There's going to be a lot of inflation going on. And it doesn't matter which government comes in, conservative or labor, they're going to be really struggling to control prices, wages, and balance the budget. If you were a nurse, would you... Yeah, if I was a nurse, if I was a nurse, I'd probably go on strike. If I was the government, I'd be completely terrified about what that means. And I'd be worried Mm. even if I was a Labour minister. Mm. Well, I think also there's a consequence here of previous actions. I felt that even as far back as the coalition government, I felt there was a strategy that was essentially all about not criticising, but but this constant sort of demanding of public sector workers to do more, a lot of criticism of what they did. And I think that was cranked up under Johnson. Then we had those sort of, you know, clap for carers and don't we love the NHS? And they were the, the angels and all that stuff that was sort of pumped out there. And then they do, I think, get a bit of a kick in the teeth. And our next door neighbor's a nurse. And, you know, you talk to people who work in the health service at the moment, they say it really is incredibly pressured, very, very difficult. And they feel all they get is abuse from the government. So I completely understand both Emma and Vincent and if only we had a government that actually addressed their concerns rather than sought to exploit them, I think that would be better. But I, I'm, I'm with you, but addressing concerns is going to turn out to probably be a much more difficult poison thing for Labour when they take over than, than yeah, we're maybe, acknowledging, maybe. just saying that quickly. Yeah. Okay. Now, listen, we talked briefly yesterday about Ukraine. There's a question here 
from PEOW. To what extent is a possible return of the Republicans to power in two years in the States a factor in the Ukraine war? Surely if the war is still going at that point and they win the election, Ukraine have an enormous problem. Might Russia start to bank on this? Well, at the moment, there's pretty strong bipartisan support for the Ukraine war. That, that's one of the things that Biden's doing, which there isn't much Republican opposition to. The skepticism is only coming from the far Trump wing of the party. So the question is, if Trump wins, yes, there is a problem. I think Trump is has a very, very odd relationship with Putin. And you will have seen interviews with General Flynn, who was his very controversial national security advisor. Oh, God, it was awful. Did you see that interview where he was did, basically yeah. attacking Zelensky? Yeah. Um, so I, I think that, that there is a very worrying fringe that people will be concerned about. But at the moment, it looks like the leading candidate really at the moment is, is DeSantis. And I don't know how much the UK media have been covering DeSantis, but Ron DeSantis now seems to be ahead of Trump on a lot of the indicators. He's um, part of this strange American phenomenon of these kind of people who I think he went to Yale University but was also in the United States Navy, but somehow uses this quite establishment background to be very, very anti-establishment. He just flew a plane load of Mexican immigrants to Martha's Vineyard, which is the kind of super wealthy retreat of the liberal elite, uh, to try to make a point because he's a Florida politician that the liberal elite in the United States doesn't really understand immigration because it's not really happening to them in the same mm. way. Mm. But he, anyway, I don't think DeSantis's views on Russia and Ukraine are actually that, uh, are as concerning as Trump's. Mm, okay. Okay. Katie Parker. Suella Braverman wants to recategorize cannabis as a class A drug. This would have knock-on effects for our already overcrowded courts and prisons, not just overcrowded courts, but courts that you can barely get a case through, clogging them up even more. Is Braverman's proposal just nationalist populist madness? What do you think? Yes. Yes. Well, <laughs> oh, I mean, can cannabis is a class A drug. It's like, and also, you know, we were, t you were talking yesterday about what, uh, what can we do to kind of, I actually think that legalization of cannabis and the, the marketization of cannabis, which is happening in a lot of different parts of the United States. And I think Joe Biden has moved on this fairly recently as well. You could actually see it as a bit of a, a bit of a money spinner, but I'm afraid Braverman really is. There was a wonderful, um, oh, what does this say? Was it private eye? It was a couple of, a headshot of Suella Braverman and Pretty Patel, and Suella Braverman's speech bubble says, "How do you think I'm doing?" And Pretty Patel says, "I think you could probably be a bit more compassionate." <laughs> <laughs> I think when Pretty Patel is seen as more compassionate than her successor, then we're in we're in real trouble. Right? Question from you. Go on. So, Perry, why do XMPs struggle? Rory made a comment in passing last week that XMPs can't find it very difficult to find employment after leaving Parliament. Can you expand on this? I imagined it to be the opposite, as many seem to fall into comfy roles in the private sector that probably pay a lot more. Now, oddly, that, that just isn't true. And I, I don't know whether you want to talk about Labour MPs who are friends of yours and, and what's happened. But the truth is that the old days were, may have been true in the 1960s and 1970s, where MPs could go into private sector jobs comfortably after they left, have, have left. A couple of reasons. One of them is that we used to have a lot of nationalized industries in Britain, which were basically controlled by the government. So it was very easy for the government to put ex-MPs onto the boards of nationalized industries. That's all gone. But also the reputation of MPs is so low that people don't think there's any status on having on their board somebody who's been a member of parliament. Increasingly, they're looking for, if you're a bank or something, looking for someone on your board, you're looking for somebody who knows something about the subject area. Mm. And MPs are not really qualified. I mean, increasingly, they're professional politicians. They, many, many of them now have started as councillors. They've started as party activists. They've done almost nothing else in their lives than politics for 20 or 30 years. And unless they're lucky enough to have a professional qualification as an accountant or a lawyer or something like that, it's very, very difficult for them to get a job. So, I, I mean, have you reflected on this? I mean, have you Labour MPs who've left? I, I Look, I, I think if you are the top level, um, if you look at how much Theresa May gets paid for, you know, Theresa May was not the greatest orator, but she's in the sort of top league of big money public speaking sector. Uh, I'm sure David Cameron's making lots of money in different ways. Tony Blair makes lots of money. John Major makes lots of money. I think at that level. Yeah, that's prime minister. I mean, a prime minister. No, and you see people, you see people, and I agree, you see people like George Osborne is making a fortune. Philip Hammond is making a fortune. But I think most MPs, I think you're right. I think they struggle. I think they struggle financially. I think they struggle psychologically. You get good pensions, you guys, don't you? Former MPs get good pensions. Yeah, it depends. It depends how long you're in the House of Commons, though. And the, remember the pension, I don't want to defend MPs particularly, but the pension, uh, the, it's an unusual job because the salary you enter on is the same as the salary that you would have if you'd been there 50 years. Mm. It's, it, there's no seniority 
involved in the job um, because every MP is equal, so they all get the same backbench salary. Uh, yeah. Pension contributions come off that. It's a decent salary. It's more than most people in Britain get, but it's considerably less than you would get as a GP or as a head teacher of a large school. So becoming an MP is definitely not not a way to get wealthy. And no, I remember Eric Heffer, Eric Heffer, the Labour MP, always used to say, "There's, there's nothing more X than an X MP." Yeah. Well, I, 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 I talked to somebody who was my predecessor in a government department who was actually looking at stacking shelves at Tesco. So after he left, I mean, it's, it's a uh, that's that's obviously very extreme. I mean, that's not usually what happens. Usually, what happens is they end up in an even more humiliating world, often, which is getting into public affairs. So you get paid not a great deal of money to try to promote some private sector company. And then you get into difficulty because you're mm. accused of lobbying. You're trying to call up your ex-colleagues. It's very embarrassing. You sit in the portcullis, which is the tea room, so the kind of mo- the more modern tea room of the House of Commons. And you s- see this slightly depressing scene of your former colleagues coming in table to table, trying to hand out brochures, saying, can I just mm. get 10 minutes of your time? And it's, bit sad. it's, it's a bit sad. Yeah. A bit sad, yeah. Now, Jude Carrier... I read today about the tax breaks being offered to people to set up in free ports. I'm very worried about these and what they mean in terms of employment, environmental and planning protections that free ports seem to evade. How worried should we be? Well, I think we should be very worried. And we've talked a lot about this in relation to the whole sovereign individual agenda, low tax, no regulation, piss on the workers kind of thing. And the FT at the weekend had a story that even Quasi Quartegui started to get worried. I don't know if you saw this, Rory, basically said that the Liz Truss has overruled Kwarteng, who wanted to put a limit on the number of applications for low-tax investment zones. And I guess the, the worry, if you're the government, and particularly if you're the Treasury, is that you risk losing billions and billions and billions of pounds in, in lost taxes. And she's, really, she's, she's saying that we shouldn't have any limit. Well, is she saying the whole country should become an investment zone? It's completely catastrophic. So if you set up uh, one of these zones, you can get 100% relief on your uh, machinery investment, you get 100% mm-hmm. relief for the first year on your business rates. You get a massive holiday on national insurance. So what is so worrying from a, again, from a sort of one nation fiscally conservative background is that this is potentially a blank check, which could cost the government 40 billion pounds a year in the worst case scenario, if you end up with too many of these things opening everywhere. And generally what the treasury has always argued and would probably continue to argue today, is that it just displaces activity from elsewhere. It doesn't help the overall economy. In most cases, it simply moves investments that would be going into the other parts of the country somewhere else, but it doesn't bring new investment in. Are the investment zones part of the anti-growth coalition? The investment zones, sadly, uh, that's a nice question, and I can see where you're coming from there. (laughs) I think the awful thing is that actually it's what worries me more about the whole stuff, which is it's the growth at any cost but no revenue from the government coalition. And that's what's that's why, why I as a more, you know, conservatism used to be about prudence and restraint when it came to this stuff. Mm. And what worries me is I, if I was, you know, I, we've talked about this in the past, but Keir Sama needs to turn it around and say, um, you know, growth at any cost is a very disturbing thing. Here's a question that I got, uh, maybe quickly on this. Ian Birdsall, please, can you explain what a one nation conservative is? It's a phrase I just don't understand. And what are you if you're not a one nation conservative? Do you want me to have a little quick go at that? Well, before you do, I remember when we talked about Bill Clinton up in Blackpool and one, one of his uh, favorite piece of advice, he, he, he once said, just remember when they talk about compassionate conservatism, the only word that counts in that is conservatism. <laughs> <laughs> so exp- explain one nation. The, the one nation tradition began with Benjamin Disraeli back in the 19th century. And it's essentially about an argument about yeah, social solidarity about not having a society that's divided between the very rich and the poor. And it became under Mrs. Thatcher a slogan for people that, you know, I'm one of them, right? So we would have called ourselves moderate or center, center right politicians. And she called um, you wets. And she called us wets. So yeah, one nation Tories are wets. That's the traditional definition. And the <laughs> other side of it are the dry right wing uh, conservatives who in the case of Liz Trust, tend to this very libertarian view, which mm. is um, which is the only thing that matters is economics and growth. Just before we go to the break, a little, little poem, a little 18th century poem for you here. Um, actually, it's Yeats on, on the 18th century. What he would have said about Liz Trust is she's not really a Tory, definitely not a one nation conservative. He's what he would have called a Whig. And he says about these great 18th century conservative thinkers, 
like Burke, Barclay, Goldsmith, he said, all hated Wiggery, that leveling, rancorous, rational sort of mind that never looked out of the eye of a saint or out of a drunkard's eye. All's Wiggery now, and we old men amassed against the world. Mm, nice. So we stand for the saints and the drunkards in the One Nation tradition. Let's go to a break. <laughs> Right, welcome back to The Rest is Politics. Question time with me, Alistair Campbell. And me, Rory Stewart. And Rory, Rory, are you going to tell me that you that poem just came out of your memory bank as opposed to your sitting at a laptop with access to every piece of information under the sun? Genuinely, genuinely, promise, 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 promise came out of my memory. Oh, well, excellent, excellent. Just Thank shows you. that. And that was learnt at the school that the audience <laughs> in Blackpool said I should bang on about more. We had a vote, didn't we? <laughs> I think I, I learned it actually in Indonesia after ah, I left okay. the school. Um, cool. Here's relevance to Lib Dems. Good question, I thought, from a guy called Rob Blackburn. As someone highly disillusioned by the collapse of the moderate, sensible Conservative Party, but not fully confident in the policies and ability of the Labour Party, I find myself wondering where the Lib Dems are in all of this chaos and why they aren't cutting through more. What are your thoughts on this? What do they need to do to find their voice? And I think that is an important question because I think the collapse of the moderate, sensible Conservative Party is clear, but I do think that there are, he, he put his finger on some of the things that people will worry about with Labour, which is, are they fully confident in their fully policies, fully confident in their ability? And where are the Lib Dems? Where are the Lib Dems, Alistair? What's happened to them? Well, they, they, of course, had the misfortune of having to cancel their conference, didn't they, because of the, the Queen's death. So I suppose that would have given them a bit of national public attention. They've suffered from two things that have happened in quick succession. One, the coalition. I, I think Nick Clegg was right to take the Lib Dems into coalition. I think if you're fighting an election and you want to be part of government, you go into it when you get the chance. But that definitely damaged their brand and their electoral standing thereafter because of the whole austerity thing and tuition fees and everything else. And then the second thing that happened is that after the last election, you've got to remember that the, the coverage that is particularly across the, the national channel, the, the big national channels, which then sort of feed down into the rest of the media ecosystem, is dependent upon how many seats you have in Parliament. So even something like Question Time, I mean, people will probably notice that Ian Blackford is called far more regularly at Question Time than uh, Ed David, the leader of the Liberal Democrats. So these things have had an impact. But then added to that, I think they've made a mistake in uh, echoing Labour's line on Brexit and sort of basically making a gigantic elephant in the room that nobody talks about. They don't have a distinctive economic message. They don't have a distinctive social policy message. They, they will probably say, oh, we have lots of policies. It's just people don't know about them. Well, I'm sorry, in the modern world, that's just tough. You've got to make sure that people do know about them. Did you work with them closely? We, I know you were very strongly, obviously, on the Remain second referendum side, which the Lib Dems were on in those days. Did you, did you have a lot to do with the Lib Dems in those days when you were thrown out of Labour. Did you see much more of them then? Uh, not really. I mean, they. I voted Lib Dem in the European elections, but that was about trying to get the Labour Party to change its position, which eventually it did. And the Lib Dems were terribly excited and thought that I was going to become a Lib Dem, which um, I never was. And I, look, I had a lot. I had lots to do with them, but also had lots to do with you know pro Remain Tories during the People's Vote campaign. But I think they are in a bit of a tricky position. But also, I wouldn't rule out that they become very, very significant in this th next election because there are parts of the country where for Labour to win, they need the Lib Dems to do pretty well. I mean, down, I was down in the West Country recently, and, you know, down there, there are some seats that Labour can take, but there are an awful lot of seats that are going to have to be taken by the Lib Dems. And when we were talking yesterday about the polling being so bad for the Tories, don't forget that, that the SNP is still polling well in Scotland. So that suggests, actually, that because the Scots are taken into account in the national polls, that suggests Labour are doing even better in England than the polls might indicate. But the Lib Dems are going to have to do well in certain parts of the country if the choice are going to be got rid of. And I think a big driver, there's always a central question at any general election. There's usually one negative and one positive. And I think the negative question is, we've got to get rid of the Tories or, you know, can we really afford another term of the Tories? And then more positively, you know, has Labour got the positive agenda to get over the line? It's such a, it's such a mystery, isn't it? Because given there are so many people, to some extent, you and me, but definitely many, many people who listen to this podcast who feel that they are in the center of British politics and are a bit suspicious of left and right. And, and given that actually for many years, the public opinion was like a kind of bell jar with the votes in the center and not many votes on either side. 
it's extraordinary that the Lib Dems have performed historically so badly that the Liberal Party died in England in the famously in the early 20s, mm. and that it's never really managed to come back in 100 years. And I, 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 it's, it's, it's a bit mysterious. When I was running to be London Mayor as an independent, somebody suggested that I could reach out to the Lib Dems and see if I could become their candidate. And the polling suggested that my vote share would have collapsed from something like 13, 15% down to 5% if I'd become the Lib Dem candidate that actually being an independent was a stronger brand than being a Lib Dem in London, certainly then, 2020. Wow, that's interesting. I mean, I think the, look, we're back to the, we've talked about this many, many times, the strength of the two parties, both the main parties are strong. Somebody once said to me not long ago of, of Labour, the problem with Labour is it's too weak to win and too strong to die. Now, actually, I think at the moment, Labour is in a pretty good position to win. Uh, but the Lib Dems, I think the peak, the modern peak was... The coalition years, and they've paid a price for that. Anthony Bohan. Yep. It sounds like Paul Dacre and Nadine Dorries will soon be joining the likes of Baroness Fox of Buckley and Lord Lebedeff of Hampton, Siberia. Isn't it time to abolish or reform the House of Lords? Well, I'm a big reform person. I would like to see a House of Lords. None of the politicians would like it, but I'd like to see it composed of people more like crossbenchers. I, I was always very, very impressed by the senior judges, diplomats, academics, people like the amazing Martin Rees, the uh, astronomer royal in the House of Lords. The quality of their debates was often much, much higher because these guys knew an incredible amount. They'd had very long careers. They had an enormous amount of information. So if you want to see a debate on foreign policy, the House of Lords had a much higher quality of debate in the House of Commons. On military stuff, it's obviously got a lot of generals and defense experts in it. But what we have to do, I'm afraid, is get rid of the donors and the politicians. Yeah, but Rory, the, the problem with, it, it is part of the legislative process. So what you're describing is a kind of expert debating chamber, which may have a place in our politics. But I think reform has got to go way further than that. I, I always had this this dream that, in, in a sense, we'd have very we'd have a the House of Commons as the centre of our kind of democratic debate. We'd have really powerful regional assemblies, and there'd be some kind of link into that. And then we'd also have the European Parliament. But we're, we're out of that now, so there's no point thinking of that for the time being. Look, I've, I've actually written my column for the New European about this this week, pegged to the, the new names that have come forward, which, I mean, the idea of Paul Dacre, I mean, honestly, Paul Dacre, he's, he's done so much damage to our political debate. He's nothing but an establishment hack who pretends to be an anti-establishment. And I felt sort of strangely pleased when I heard that he was definitely going to go there because I think it so debases the whole thing. It, it shows that Johnson has learned nothing. It shows Truss has learned nothing. And then, of course, we're going to get his resignation on us as well, which are going to be truly horrific. So I'm hoping this is just another nail in the coffin of the House of Lords. One of the things you will have read um, is that he's also proposing to do something very unusual, which is in his resignation on us, push MPs who are currently in the House of Commons into the House of Lords, which would trigger a by-election. You'd end up with seven by-elections, which would and be- trust doesn't want that. Catastrophic for trust at the moment. The, the reason I'm very strongly against an elected House of Lords is that we would end up in the US problem of the standoff between Congress and Senate. Mm. In, in a way, what's good about the House of Lords is it doesn't have democratic legitimacy. So all it can do is delay legislation. But if you had two elected chambers, the people in the upper house would begin to say, well, we're elected just like the lower house. We have every right to block legislation. We have just as much democratic legitimacy as they do. And we would then find ourselves in gridlock. So I would much rather go on the crossbench model, have people who are experts, who represent different professions, lean into diversity in the House of Lords and make it a really impressive debating chamber, but not have it elected, because I think elected would be gridlock. Mm. Here's one, Rory. Uh, similar theme. Jay Hearn. Hello from North Sydney. I love Sydney. Will the Liberal Democrats and the Greens increase their seats in the next election? More than 30% of Australian voters did not vote for a major party in 2021. Communities are now running independence in North South Wales and Victoria lower houses and hope to hold the balance of power. So this is our old friend, the Teals, isn't it? But I don't think that's going to happen here. You know, well, the problem is they've got a single transferable vote system, haven't they? Which yeah. allows them to do, uh, which really helps an independent. Um, I think there's a huge market for it. I think there's an enormous market for Teals, which is fiscally conservative, environmentally progressive, 
candidates the centre. And I think you could imagine having a really strong, attractive party doing that. But I can't quite see the Lib Dems being that party. Adam Blackburn, would right-wing media back Labour again? So the recent polling, are we likely to see the right-wing aligned media ever move to supporting Labour? Or have things changed since New Labour and these publications are too far down the rabbit hole to want to realign? Would Murdoch want to back a horse bound to lose, though? Um, Don't know. Don't know. Don't really care that much. Oh, you um, do care, Alice. So you're always saying the right wing media is the key to the thing, aren't you? No, I've never said it's the key. I think it's the key to the framing of the debate. And that's why I rail at the broadcasters from time to time. No, look, I'd rather the newspapers, all of them, took politics seriously, treated all the parties reasonably fairly and had at least some separation of news and comment. That's gone. It's just That's gone. not going to happen. And, and that's not true of the mirror of The Guardian either. No, I agree. I agree. I think, will they shift? Um, I don't know. A lot depends on how they, I mean, you look at the Express literally every day. It's just like a trust fanzine. It's gone from being a Johnson fanzine to being a trust fanzine. The mail sort of, you know, is trying to sort of face a little bit both ways. I haven't really seen much of the sun recently. I noticed the Sunday Times have become much more critical. So I suppose it's not impossible, but I think at this stage it's unlikely. I think Murdoch, who's a terrifying figure in so many ways, but I think he likes a winner. And if he concludes Mm. that this trust is incompetent and isn't going to win, I think it's very likely that he'll change. Mm. Don't forget as well, he's, he's, um, you know, he's, he's, how can I put this gently? He's he's getting on. Um, Karl Marx, I don't Karl think Marx? he's the. Yeah, I don't think he's the Karl Marx because Could be. Could I, be. I saw his grave recently when I went up to see oh, really? oh. Philip Gould's grave and my friend John Merritt. This one here's a question directly to me and directly to you, Alistair. Did you vote for Labour under Jeremy Corbyn? Yes, I did. And would you expect Corbyn supporters to still vote Labour under Keir Starmer? Yes, I would. Rory Stewart, who will you vote for in the next election? Core blimey, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Really difficult one. I would find it impossible to vote. I'm afraid at the moment for Liz Truss's Conservative Party. I'm just horrified by the direction. It's not what I ever believed in. The thing for me, which makes it difficult, and I think for some of my colleagues who are still in Parliament, is that obviously we have been aware for a dozen years or more, or maybe many of us, 20 years, that being a Conservative is very, very unpopular, that many people think that we are a very, very nasty party, that we're actually out there deliberately to damage people. And we've been trying to defend ourselves and say, no, that isn't what we're about. We are a party that believes in prudence at home, restraint aboard, love of tradition, evolution, not revolution, pragmatism, local communities. And now we have Liz Truss, and Liz Truss is like the worst possible vision. It it feels to me, as I imagine Jeremy Corbyn will have felt to moderate Labour voters, that Corbyn sort of revealed a side of far-left Labour socialism that many moderate Labour MPs had been trying to deny and say, we're not a party run by this conflict. So Liz Truss is the kind of Jeremy Corbyn of our party. Right. So you, but you haven't answered the question. You said you'd find it hard to vote for Liz Truss. Well, so I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't vote for Liz Truss, and I'm surprised. And I'm surprised you were prepared to vote for Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party. I'm actually quite slightly shocked by that. Well, I voted Labour because I thought that was the only way to get rid of the Tories, and I, 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 I and actually you really went thought Jeremy Corbyn would have been better than Theresa May. Um, Theresa May wasn't standing. It was Boris Johnson. Well, how did you vote in 2017 when oh, she was yeah, standing? Sorry, I beg your pardon. Yeah, I voted, I voted for Jeremy then. But to be honest, I think I think one of the reasons Theresa May got a majority is people didn't actually think Jeremy Corbyn could win. And I think one of the reasons that Boris Johnson won as, as well as he did was because people by then thought that Jeremy Corbyn might win. But I wanted to get a kind of, you know, progressive alliance, I guess, was what I was after. But I think now, I do think that a combination, and even this coalition against growth, whatever it was she came up with, they're trying to get this concept into the public mind that a coalition would be terrible, that if it's sort of Keir Starmer and Nicola Sturgeon or Keir Starmer and, and Ed Davey. But actually, one of the upsides of Ed Davey is I don't think people see him as as threatening in a way that maybe they did with Joe Swinson. I hope you vote Labour, Roy, uh, Roy, but I also hope that if it's in a seat that the Liberal Democrats can win and Labour can't, that you'd maybe vote tactically. Gabriella. WikiLeaks. You haven't answered the question. You haven't answered the question. Well, I don't, I, I'm definitely not going to vote for Liz Truss's Conservative Party, but I'll have to work out what I do when I get into that. And, and have you not yet decided? I have not yet decided, no. I've not yet decided. Not okay. yet decided. Okay, here's, here's, here's a question. How do we build political community? E.E. E. Fry. Your Blackpool show gave me a sense of political community I'd not felt in an extremely long time. I think that was because the Max Miller jokes that we told are musical jokes. I felt (laughs) safe for the first time in ages. How do we build on that? How do we create a community for the disenfranchised, politically homeless citizens of nowhere? What 
do I do now? There we are. So what does EE Fry do now? Well, EE Fry, what do you do now? First of all, you, you wait excitedly for my next book, which is going to be called What Can I Do? Oh. Um, and then I think there'll be lots of the answers in there. I'm glad that EE e. Fry felt that about our gathering. I think if there'd been a general election in the hall, Labour would have won. But I think yeah. there were Lib Dems in there. I think there were Greens in there. I think there were Tories. I think there were young people who were too young to vote. And I think thinking about it in the concept of a political community, I think we do have to win this idea that it's possible to have serious, intelligent, informed debate, that we don't always have to agree with every dot and comma of everything that the other person is saying, but that we can still kind of get along. And I think the other thing we have to do, we have to keep calling out the stuff that we disagree with and the stuff that we don't like. And the responsibility to call it out is even greater when the people who are doing the worst things are the people in power. And then I'd say to E.E. E. Fry, join a party, whatever your politics are, join a party, join campaigns, be active, stay active, get active, and just don't give up hope. Very good. Okay, now, final one. I think we're coming up towards the end here. At From Escobar, I came all the way from Warsaw to see you. So he came from Warsaw to Blackpool. That's quite the journey, particularly with the train strikes on. You've not mentioned Poland much in your podcast. What is your take on Poland's crazy right-wing government? They're crazy. Yeah, well, just, just to remind people, so Law and Justice Party, pick fights European Union, taking a very hard-line approach to women's rights. It's tried to muzzle independent media, done strange stuff with the courts. So it's very much a nativist populist government, but it's one that, of course, has caused a lot of confusion. I mean, it's disintegrating European democratic values. But of course, the war in Ukraine has given it an mm. opportunity to project itself as the great champion of European solidarity in defense of Ukraine and democratic values. Mm. Mm. Well, first of all, I'm, I think we should thank him. If he, if he genuinely came to Blackpool just to see us, I feel rather bad because you did at one point ask people how far they'd come. Nobody shouted out Warsaw. Um, I think Chichester was the furthest away that I heard. So he came from Warsaw. So I, I sort of feel bad that we didn't give him lots of love and special attention. We should have done. We should have done. We should have got him backstage and yeah. had a yeah. look around and stuff. But look, I, I think there's, there are two reasons, I think, why Poland and its government doesn't get quite the opprobrium that others do. One is that because actually there, most people these days know polls. There are a lot of polls. A lot have gone back, but we, you know, polls have become a pretty big part of British life. And and I think actually that's maybe now people get their assessment of Poland through the fact that we know more Polish people and they seem quite nice and they're very hardworking, et cetera, et cetera. But the second thing is that Orban takes most of the heat on the whole sort of Visegrad stuff. And I think that Poland stays a little bit under the radar. And your final point about Ukraine, I think, is incredibly important. They have, they have shown a very different side to themselves in relation to Ukraine. And because Ukraine has been so defining in in recent months, that has maybe yeah. uh, taken the heat off them as well. But I mean, the change is extraordinary, isn't it? Because they were flirting really with kind of right wing nativist populism and the authoritarian regimes. And then they flipped around and they went from, you remember they were, when there was this problem in Belarus, there were water cannons and truncheons, the Poles driving back Belarus and migrants at the border, suddenly flipped to taking one and a half million Ukrainians almost overnight into Poland. So it, yeah. it's been a very interesting sort of reshaping. And it, it, it's, it's a sign that you can be a strong part of European political values, oddly, while not signing up to the full democratic agenda. Anyway, I, mm. it's something we should explore more. Maybe we should, well, maybe we should do a podcast in, in Poland someday. Yeah, absolutely. We should go to Poland. Absolutely. We should get a train. We should get a train. Because you spend too much time on aeroplanes, Rory. And you and you would, I noticed your defense of your or your flying. At least I admitted I felt guilty about it. I felt your defense didn't go down well with the audience. Well, I sort of thought it was a bit bit rich when I for the sake of the audience, I had just completely shattered myself <laughs> flying all the way from Jordan to Blackpool and then Blackpool to Marrakesh to be attacked for getting on a plane. I thought, screw you, I'll do it on I'll do it on video conference. Let's, next let's, time. Let's, let's, here's, here's an invitation to get on another very long flight. Somebody with a wonderful name of Fernanda Diez. I am a dual British Argentine citizen living in Argentina since last year. I want to extend a running invitation to you both to come and visit because Rory once remarked he knew very little about Latin America. So, Fernanda, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you do, but thank you for the invitation. And it sounds very, and, very. And, and I think we'll be traveling by boat as part of your 
as part of Alice's new carbon retention thing. Oh, we could swim. We could swim. As you <laughs> bottled out of the Blackpool swim. Yeah, I, I, I would love to hear about your Blackpool swim, Alice. How did it go? <laughs> Well, because you bottled out, and because the oh, tide was so I don't because, think be... because the tide was so far out. Yeah, oh, dearie des- me, this is desperate. I decided to leave early and get home, but I went to the line. Home. It's the one bit I, I know. I never get to give you comms advice because you're a much more able comms person than me. But my small bit of comms advice is: before you accuse somebody else of bottling out of a swim, check you've done the <laughs> swim yourself. <laughs> all right, guys. On that, farewell. All the best. <laughs>